Oh yeah. Okay. You are on Live Life Better, and we are talking to Peter Hellebron today. He is a financial expert, boss of everything. Ching 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 ching. Money. That's right. What makes the world goes round. Also, what makes us fucked up. But we need it to eat, to sleep, to do things, to have shelter. Um, and so, my hope is that he will give you some insight into your financial health to help you be better at that. Um, I want everyone to have a great life. So check it out. He is an awesome wealth of knowledge and I hope you enjoy it. Oh yeah. Ooh, ah, ah. Ooh, chakalaka. Welcome to Live Life Better. This is Scott Eastwood. I want you to live the best version of your life. We're all human beings, We're all just trying to figure it out. Find something you love and chase it. Now we, roll. we are comfortable and live. Peter, thank you so much for coming today, man. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, you were just telling me a story about the last dollar uh, your father gave you. Yeah. Uh, when you graduated college. Yes. yes. What, what happened? He, uh, he handed you a card? Yeah. So I graduated from college and um, my uh, my dad, we were having this big party afterwards. Everyone's all excited. I was excited to be done. I was like raring to get out in the workforce and make my way in the world. And at the end of the night, my dad handed me a card with a $1 bill in it. Um, <laughs> and I, I opened it up and there was a dollar. It's sort of like, well, that's interesting. And uh, I said, Dad, like, what you know, what what's this? And he said, uh, That's the last dollar I'm ever going to give you. You know, you're, we we got you this far. Now you're now you're on your own. So, uh, yeah. So I learned how I, to invest, I, Peter. Yeah, yeah. I, was, <laughs> I, was, I was just saying, I uh, graduated on Saturday, started working on Monday, and you know, here yeah, I am. And that was that. Fifteen years later, and uh, you know, it's a little scary to kind of make my way into the world, but thus far, uh, that shove is important. Yeah, for you sure. You know what I mean? I've see I see a lot of especially. Here in Southern California, I see kids, I see young people who are enabled by their mm -hmm. parents and then they become completely fucked up. Yeah. You know? Yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, for me, I think my parents always had a really healthy um, respect for work and for kind of, you know, making your own way. And they yeah. supported me. And I mean, my parents are my greatest champions. No question. My dad's like still one of my best friends. Sure. Um, even though he cut me off. Uh, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but, <good thing. laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think that that's really important. Now I have kids of my own, and so I can kind of see, you know, why that is so important. Uh, but yeah, I think you gotta you gotta have a respect for it for sure. So tell our listeners what you do. Sure. So um, I work for a bank, a global custody bank, technically. Um, what does custody mean? Custody is like you're you're actually holding the assets. A custodian. Um, a custodian, exactly. So you're actually taking physical custody of the assets. Um, and we have a very large investment management business. And I work here in Los Angeles in our investment management business. I run our investment management practice here locally. We have a couple offices here. Um, and uh, we invest money on behalf of wealthy individuals and institutions um, and provide uh, what we call goals-based financial advice um, to those folks. And um, I, this is pretty much all I've ever done. Really? Um, yeah. I graduated from college, got a, a sort of short-term uh, job, I would say, for a couple of months um, in financial services, totally by accident. Had no idea what I was doing. Literally walked into the wrong room in an on-campus interview. No way. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right down the road here at Loyola Marymount. So shout out to the Lions. Um, for sending me the wrong room, but uh, but yeah, I got a got a sort of short term job. Figured out that wasn't really what I wanted to do. I wanted to pivot into something still within financial services, but a little bit different. Um, and fifteen years later, here I am. So, how does one go about becoming? Because that's a that's a pr probably a pretty coveted position, right? Mm -hmm. To to mm -hmm. be in charge and to be, you know. Uh, at least a charge of a sector or, or one practice of of the division. I'm sure there's you have bosses and there. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm one one yeah. cog in a in gigantic a wheel. wheel. <laughs> sure, yeah. sure. But how does one go about that? You know, uh, you know, you don't obviously know how to invest. You don't yeah. know when you're when you're coming out when you got yeah. no skill set. Yeah. How does one? Is there a, is there? Did you go to? Was a school you went to at Loyola? Yeah. Was it, 
So I, I undergrad, um, I studied business, which I think gave me a really good foundation for just understanding, you know, how business works, kind of the basics of economics, things like that. But you're right. I mean, it doesn't really teach you sort of personal finance or investments. Um, I did get an MBA um, at Anderson School at UCLA, um, and I have what's called a CFA, which is a, a Charter Financial Analyst designation, which in our business is kind of like the gold standard for investment management. Okay. Um, but really, along the way, it was it was really just kind of trial and error. I would say for a long time, you know, I worked. Um, I was really lucky that I had mentors early on that, um, you know, I think uh, helped me progress and and really learn the business from the ground up. So the first job that I had in this business, you know, the the guys that I worked for at the time, they were like, "Look, we're going to really have you learn everything, not just how to place a trade in a client's account." Um, but also, you know, how to talk to clients, how to send a wire out, like like very, very sort of basic blocking and tackling mm -hmm. that I think a lot of other folks don't have the privilege of getting early on. And I really use that as a foundation to leapfrog um, and, uh, and, and and really learn more about the business. And I'm, you know, I think I'm a student of the business. Um, I'm always trying to find ways to get better at what I do. I'm always trying to find ways to help people differently. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that... I, I think probably my biggest strength is that I know what I don't know, and that is a lot. That's good, <laughs> and uh, so it keeps me, you know, keeps me grounded in that way. And um, you know, I, I I just really enjoy what I do, and it's it's a lot of fun. A wise man said, uh, "A man has got to know his limitations." I think that was a Clint Eastwood line. Actually, I have many of them. <laughs> yeah, wise man. <laughs> um, uh, so for for the general audience, the stock market is like a daunting thing, mm -hmm. I think. And I think a lot of people who don't, you know, live, breathe, and, and die by it and, and sort of understand the investment world, it's really daunting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have money, and I even think it's daunting, mm -hmm. right? I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, I don't really know. Yeah. How do you learn about it in, yeah. in, in your setting? Do, do they just teach you? Do they... Yeah. So, um, I mean, you know, in, in my line of work, you know, you have these training programs, which kind of give you the basics of it. You have to get licensed. Um, is that a series seven? Yeah. So okay, I, I got a series seven, series 63, series 65. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I have a lot of, uh, letters and numbers behind my name. If you, if you look me up, but, uh -huh. um, but yeah, so there is some basic licensing and, and, and frankly, I think most people would be able to do it if you just went through the course of study. Um, you know, I think to, to sort of demystify some of it really just takes time. But mm -hmm. I think in its simplest form, the way that I would describe it is that the stock market um, or, or the bond market or, 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 you know, any of these capital markets, really what you have is people with capital providing that people providing that capital to people that need it. So in other words, companies occasionally need money to expand or to buy new buildings or factories or whatever the case may be, and, and they will issue securities like stocks or bonds. And folks, like in, in your example, you have some money, okay, well, I want to try to earn a return on that money. I'm going to provide that capital to this company in exchange for whatever the return is. And that return, um, as you point out, can can be a little mystifying. I think that that there's a lot of people that don't really understand that, you know, fundamentally when you make an investment, any investment, you're being compensated for the risk that you're taking with that money, right? I mean, if sure. you're not being compensated for it, there's probably a problem there. So, yeah. I would tell you that 99% of the stuff that I see where people, you know, clients come in and they say, "Oh, well, so and so's got a great deal that they're working on and, you know, it's going to give me this great return." Um, I look at it, I, I try to deconstruct it and figure out, well, what are the risks here? And, and what are the premiums essentially that we're being paid for for taking on that risk? Um, and, and at the end of the day, that's really what it is. When you say you're when you say you're looking at deals, are you looking at stock deals? You're looking at mm -hmm. companies with that are public companies. Mm -hmm. Is that mostly what your your acumen is? Yeah. So so the majority of what I do is public market investing. Um, running in the in the circles that I'm fortunate enough to run in with with clients, they they tend to get a lot of private deals offered to them. Real estate deals, investing in private businesses, angel type investing, where you're yep. coming into a business really early on sure. to provide capital. Um, and so I'll look at those for them. And because of my background, my my more kind of analytical background, I have the ability to to look at that and determine, okay, is this something that makes sense or not? Yeah. I'm wrong all the time. Um, that's a that's a, you know that's a big part of, of doing sure. what I do is you got to be comfortable being wrong a lot of the time. Um, and uh, but yeah, I mean at, at the end of the day, um, I think we provide a valuable service to our clients 
uh, you know, really determining, okay, you know, what are the goals for the money that you have? What are the things that you need, liabilities maybe that you need to satisfy over the course of the coming years or, or months or weeks or however long your, your time horizon is? And then how do we allocate those assets most appropriately to, to meet those objectives? So, uh, when you, when you're looking at, you know, the stock market and you're looking at evaluating companies, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, which I probably am, that the stock market is really emotionally based as well as probably, you know, there's, there's a certain intrinsic value that a company may have, right? With market cap and, uh, what their earnings are. Mm -hmm. But if a crash happens, right, that's, didn't correct me if I'm wrong. That's when people are selling. Mm-hmm. They're getting out of the market, correct. right? Yep. So then the market's being changed by people's emotions. Yep. Yep. So how does that work when it comes to? Sure. Yeah. So you know what I would tell you is when you look at markets, it's like any business. It's really based on supply and demand, right? So if you have a high demand for a certain security, it's going to drive up the price. If you have a great deal of supply, in other words, as you point out, people selling that security, it's, it's likely to drive down the price if there aren't an equivalent number of, of buyers. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the short term, you're absolutely right. I mean, you see, geez, I mean, you know, look at the la- course of the last couple of months and, um, you know, we've got uh, what I think many people are referring to as these sort of unprecedented events taking place, um, be they, you know, sort of the U.S. standing in the world or, you know, um, Company specific things which are always going on, and you're right. In the short term, there tends to be you know sort of this buy or sell mentality, quick money, whatever. I think what we try to do is is look through that and say, okay, well, well, how much of this is the signal of something that's coming or something that's happening, and how much of that is just noise? And what I would tell you, Scott, when when I look at it, I I think that 99.999 percent of it is just noise. You know, it's really? just it's just a distraction. You know, CNBC um, or or Bloomberg or you know any of these financial news networks, they need to find stuff to talk about. Sure, and drama, so, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. The drama. And so on it. Yeah, I mean, like any like any television station, um, they're going to look at it and say, well, how do we position this to get people to watch and to sell more? You know, uh, sell more yeah. ads. And ultimately, by sensationalizing much of this, you, you get to that outcome. Um, and what I would tell you is, if you're a long term investor. Most of this stuff is not going to matter. You know, one of the things I often ask clients, they say, "Well, the market's been so volatile; it's up and down every day. What are we going to do? Should we change anything?" I say to them, "Okay, how often do you price your house? Like, how often do you go online at Zillow or Trulia or any of these sure. sites and say, what's my house worth?' Well, maybe once or twice a year. Okay, but you look at your portfolio every day." It's really the same thing. They're both assets that you own that you're probably going to own for a long period of time. Why are sure. you looking at this stuff every day? It'll drive you crazy. Um, and whether you're in volatile times or less volatile times, 2017 was one of the least volatile years on record in uh, in the global stock market. Uh, 2018 started out a little more volatile, but we really don't know why. I mean, there's different reasons that you can point to. People say, well, you know, I referenced earlier, you know, the U.S. standing in the world. We pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord. We pulled out of the Iran deal. There seems to be kind of a lot of policy volatility. We had most of that stuff last year, too, and there wasn't much. So I would tell you that most of it is really just noise. If you're a long-term investor, you got to look at, you know, the underlying fundamentals of the markets that you're looking in um, and and determine, are these assets that I think through time are going to be good investments? Because if you have a short-term time horizon, you're just looking at a day, a week, a month, you know, equity investing, stock market investing is probably not the right thing to be doing. Got it. Now, is there a certain financial position you need to be in to really, to be in the in the stock market? Sure. Like, the, the, it's like a meaning, it is a meaningful way? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I always tell. Um, oftentimes, when I get this question, is from many of our clients' children. They'll come in and they'll say, "Well, my mom and dad are wealthy. But, you know, I don't really have much money on my own. I don't know that I can necessarily handle the volatility." And what I generally tell them is, from a sort of personal financial planning point of view. Um, you want to make sure that you have enough money in cash or some short-term instrument to satisfy your near-term liabilities. And what that means in English is essentially you need to have six months of spending really set aside, at least six months worth of spending set aside, sitting in a savings account, earning nothing, admittedly, um, but it's there for emergency purposes. And then really, and this is no different from what we do with many of our wealthiest clients, is we'll say, okay, well, you've got these near-term liabilities that you need to satisfy, your living expenses, you know, mortgage payment, groceries, you know, the, the normal stuff that all of us have. 
and then you've got some money, uh, you know, if you're lucky enough to have some money left over, then we can kind of allocate that based on the time horizon associated with it. So for the money that you know you're not going to be touching, let's say for 10 or 15 years, that that's a, a perfect, you know, um, pot of money to look to for long-term investing in, in something like equities or real estate or you know whatever sort of riskier asset there may be. If it's a near-term, if it's money that's uh, earmarked for near-term uh, expenses or liabilities, then obviously we would want to keep that in something that's you know has a little bit less volatility. That's uh, that's a, little, a bit safer, I suppose. So would you say it's the same for somebody who's investing? Ten twenty million dollars in the in the market, mm -hmm. or ten thousand dollars. Yep, no question. Same same, same philosophy. Not like I, I would tell you right now, whether you have five thousand dollars or five hundred million dollars, it is the exact same premise that you use. Nothing changes. I mean, that's kind of the beauty of this stuff. You got to have a plan. Sure. You got to stick to the plan through time, and you got to kind of augment the plan as as you know your Things plans adjust. change. Now, the the wealthiest individuals that we work with. Um, you know, many of them have issues uh, to borrow um, uh, from the May song. I believe it was 1998, "Mo Money, Mo Problems." Um, <laughs> great song, by the way. <laughs> Mo Money, yeah, I won't, I won't go That's there. That's good. But, yeah. um, Beautiful but, singing voice. But thank you. Yeah, yeah, I go falsetto every now and then. Um, but you know, the the complexities that that money creates sure. obviously are, are are greater typically when there's more of it but yeah. that doesn't mean that you know folks that that have you know less money five ten twenty thousand dollars don't have some complexity associated uh with their life um but but typically we do see more of it as the as the wealth grows so <clears throat> for people and that's 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 this is why I, I do this podcast it's so i can give back to people right mm -hmm. so i can i can help everyday people um you know, in their lives, in every facet of their lives. Today, we're talking about finance. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a normal person and you are, you know, f I call it, you know, a food, uh, a paycheck to mouth, right? Yep. You, 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 you got family, you got, you know, all these liabilities, and it's really hard to get ahead, right? It's really hard to get ahead. But let's say you can save, I don't know, a hundred dollars a week, mm -hmm. right? And you could sort of start to put that away, um, you know, and you know that's you know, four or five grand a year that you're able to save and you're able to, you know, start to save some money to, you know, invest. How would you tell that person, you know, what, what they should, yeah, you know, what they should do? Sure. So this, this gets to, I think a couple of different points. So, so the first one is, um, you know, wh what can you afford to put away? And that really is, is probably the biggest hurdle, I think, for most folks out there is, is trying to figure out, okay, well, you know, how much is enough? You know, how much is too much to where, you know, as you point out, if, if, you, if you're living, you know, paycheck to mouth and you can't afford to buy groceries, well, what good is it that you're putting, you know, a hundred bucks away, you know, per week or whatever it is, if you can't afford your, your daily life? Um, so there's a couple different things to look at. You know, I think number one is, you know, what's the entity that you're saving money in? In other words, do you have a retirement plan, a, a 401k, an, an IRA, a Roth IRA? Um, there's a variety of options out there um, that, you um, that you know, everyday people can can look at, and there are benefits and drawbacks to those. Um, and then you know, the second thing is, okay, well, can you continue to satisfy what you're doing, um, you know, while still saving? And then I think the third thing is, what are the little kind of tricks that you can play with yourself to make sure that you don't touch that money when you know you most need it? Um, uh, and and how do you set yourself up for long term success? So I think on that last point, you know, one of the little things to think about is when th there's been a, a huge amount of research done in this area, uh, what they call behavioral economics. In fact, there's a, a a professor by the name of Richard Thaler who won the Nobel Prize last year for this work. And in, in very, very simple terms, what they figured out as an example is something like this. If you go to work for a company and they have a 401k or retirement plan, which you can't touch um, until past age 60, right? And let's say you're in your late 20s. If, if they say to you, do you want to sign up? The sign up rates tend to be very, very low for the point that you just made, which is, hey, I don't have a lot of excess income right now. I don't want to be locked up into something that I can't touch for another 30 years or I'm, I'm unlikely to touch for 30 years. So the, the sign up rates tend to be very low. If they go to them with what's called negative consent, which is basically, we've signed you up for this. Do you want to opt out? 
people are more likely to say, no, I don't want to opt out. I want to stay in it. And so mm. that's just, again, that's kind of a little <clears throat> behavioral trick that you can play to say, okay, I'm going to have this money taken out of my paycheck, set aside. I'm not even going to look at it. I'm not going to pay attention to it. Sure. And I'm going to let it compound for me through time. I'll give you a, a personal example. My kids, for, for myself and my wife, one of our um, I think our, our main responsibilities or, or beliefs for us is that our kids need to have a really good education over the course of their lives. Um, I'm not going to throw them to the wolves that early. I'll wait to do the last dollar trick until maybe they're, you know, 12 or 13. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we want to save for their college education. Sure. So we, every single month, put some money aside in this college savings plan that I never look at. I have it automatically set up to invest. I don't pay any attention to it. Once a year, I'll go in and look at it. And when I do go in once a year, I'm like, wow, we've amassed a, a pretty nice chunk of change. And I've never really even noticed the money going out because it's a few hundred bucks a month or, or whatever it is. Um, so the, I think there are little th those little kind of behavioral tricks that you can play are, are sure. super helpful. Um, and I think they set you up for a longer term success. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a, that's a really great point. Um, setting that up and being responsible, not just being, you know, thinking long term, right? So many people, even if you are in a tough financial situation, it's like, well, what can I do to pretend like that doesn't even exist so I can just live within my means but 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 set myself up for success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> that's um that's great. Now with that though, if they are, let's say, putting aside money, right? They're 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 setting aside their let's call it you know whatever it is yes. annually what should they do to make that money grow sure so you know i would go back to this idea of having a plan so okay. you know identify what are your goals are the goals for long-term growth are they for capital preservation you, know, you just don't want to lose the money uh is it that you want to save up money to buy a house or a car or or whatever it is so it's back to this idea of having a plan right and then it's it's really going in and saying okay well if that's my goal then then how do i sort of bridge the gap to align that with assets so let me give you an example if my goal is long-term growth right I, i'm not going to touch this money for 20 years then i should probably invest it pretty aggressively right i should probably invest in in the stock market um, less so in bonds and cash because they tend to have lower returns over time stocks are going to have a lot of volatility but they're also going to have again you're being compensated for that risk you're going to have a higher return associated with that as well so having sort of a bucket that goes there then i would look you know again at, at sort of the nearer term money probably be a little bit safer with that there are some great websites that are available um, that, have, that have come online in recent years. Um, we, th this whole segment of our business that they call Robo Advice, um, and it's basically there, there's the two largest companies that do this are called Wealthfront and Betterment. And Wealthfront.com, Betterment.com. I'm not being paid to say that. In fact, my employer probably <laughs> wouldn't like me saying that. But um, but they're great solutions. I think they start out. I think you can start with as low as like five thousand dollars, something like that. Um, and what they do is they ask you a series of questions. So there's, there's a questionnaire that you fill out of 10 or 15 questions, whatever it is. Um, and they basically create a plan for you and it is automatically rebalanced. You never have to do anything. You never have to pay attention to it, never look at it. And over time, it, it continues to compound at whatever the rate of return is that you're gonna grow it at, but you don't have to be going in there and, and tweaking it all the time. You know, They're gonna naturally do it for you. It's what's called automatic rebalancing. Um, and so something like that, I think for, for the average person out there, you know, even if they say, you know, geez, I don't have a lot of money to invest. I don't want to pay a whole bunch of fees. You know, that that's a great solution for for folks like that at that end of the spectrum. Is that algorithm based <clears throat> or are there humans behind it doing the same homework that you do? Yeah. So um, a little bit of both. What I would say is that the trading is all algorithmic. I mean, it's all computerized. It's all automated. Um, but, you know, the, the sort of policy allocations figuring out, OK, well, if someone has um, money that's not going to be used for 20 years, they should probably buy emerging market equities versus someone that's a little bit closer in. They should buy developed market equities because developed market equities have a little bit less volatility. That that's you know there's some human touch associated with obviously with setting those allocations, mm -hmm. um, but the the sort of ongoing work around it is is you know pretty much all automated. So generally speaking, if you are you know just if your goal is retirement someday i just want to have money to be able to not work anymore and not die yep <laughs> <laughs> i mean is that you know so we've talked about 401ks and all these different things and maybe you can just touch a little bit on what is the difference between a stock and a bond and a mutual fund and yep. a, and you know sure it's different options so um when we look at different investment options so a stock is basically a security that's issued by a company um, and you're buying an ownership stake in that company 
Okay, so people again, when people think of it in these very sort of mythical terms, that that really is at the end of the day is what you're buying is you're buying an ownership interest, albeit generally a pretty small one, um, in that company's future earning stream. So they're basically what they're saying when they come to the market is they're saying, okay, we're going to issue stock. And we're going to return some of that capital either through reinvestment in the company and growth, and so the share price goes up, or they're going to pay dividends, so they're going to pay you an income stream over time. Um, most companies, it's typically some combination thereof. Um, so that, that's what a stock does. A bond is actually a debt instrument where a company or a municipality, state, whatever the case may be, is going to come out, or the federal government is going to come out and say, okay, we're going to issue debt, we're going to owe you money and we're going to pay you a, a fixed interest rate over a period of time. So the reason that bonds tend to have less volatility is there's a known payment stream that's coming back to you and you know that unless that company goes out of business or that state, you know, falls into the water, um, they're going to pay you. By the way, even if the state falls into the water, you're probably still okay, but there's a whole host of reasons for that. That this state you're talking about, California? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> that's what it's the one that most bonds. people are worried about. <laughs> um, but uh, but no, they, you know, they're, they're going to pay you back. And so that's why it's, but, but, but again, you know, going back to my original comment around risk, lower risk, you're going to get a lower return as well. So, you know, you have to continue to look at these things and it's, it's dynamic through time as your time horizon changes. You know, I, uh, many of our clients, obviously, you know, their place in life, they're a little bit older. And what I like to say is as your time horizon shortens, which is a nice way of saying as you're getting a little <laughs> bit closer to, you know, yep. uh, kicking the bucket, um, you know, your, your plan should change. And that's really, I think, good advice for anyone. You know, again, these these sort of core principles really apply to folks at, at any end of the wealth spectrum. You know, whether you're living paycheck to paycheck or you've got a you know gigantic trust fund that you're living off of, these same principles really you know apply throughout, which is kind of the nice thing about it. Yeah, California bonds. Uh, it's funny. I hear a lot of people. There's like this myth out there that, that California's broke. And it's it's really funny because it's now it's just ellipsed. I, th I can't remember which country, but it's the UK. The fifth it's now the fifth largest, largest economy, economy in the world. In the world. Yeah. yeah, and you know I, I I know this because I own many California bonds. Sure, and, sure. Yeah, <laughs> um, my financial people uh, always want me to buy California bonds. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when when I you know and I I know a fair bit about investing. I'm playing dumb for for everybody here, so I can. You know, hopefully I'm spark not playing you. dumb. No, you're <laughs> you're the expert, and and I'm you just know, dumb. We, you, I hear what you're <laughs> what you're saying, and, and I think in within that plan you're talking about is there's a lot of diversity. Yep. Right in the plan, yep. everybody knows that the key to investing is is diversifying. Yep. Right. So if you were going to give advice to the average Joe who has five thousand dollars to invest, mm -hmm. how would you break that five thousand dollars up? Sure. If I if I knew nothing about them, what I would what I would say or her what I would say is, you know, what, what we call a sixty forty portfolio, which is sixty percent risky assets, so things like stocks, real estate, commodities, whatever the case may be. 40% safe assets, that's kind of like the benchmark portfolio that most people look to. So if I didn't know your age, your circumstance in life, anything about you, I would say, okay, 60, 40 is probably a good place to start. And then let's tweak around that. And so you're absolutely right. The The biggest determinant of your ultimate investment outcome is going to be at, at what we call the asset class level. So it's, you know, what do you own in stocks versus what you own in bonds? Not necessarily whether you buy, you know, whether you buy Coke or Pepsi. Um, and I think that that's an important thing to remember because we get, again, going back to the sensationalization, we get so hung up on like, you know, what's happening out there. Timing people, the market. Yeah. And you know, and pe so. People just lose sight of the fact that if you can keep it really, really simple, you know, you can keep uh, your taxes that you pay low, you can keep the fees that you pay low and you can protect yourself against inflation. That's what it, at Northern Trust is what we call triple net investing. Um, you're probably going to be pretty successful through time, assuming that you get some decent advice along the way. Um, I think historically, it's been very difficult for the average person to get good advice. You know, advice um, has become somewhat democratized, I think, over the course of the last decade. Um, and, and I think that that's wonderful because oftentimes the people that really need that advice the most are the people that maybe don't have access as readily to those resources as, as a you know, uber wealthy person would. So I, I think that that's wonderful. So y y you think it's 
it's harder to get good advice for the yeah. average Joe? Yes. No because question. there's so much noise out there. there. There's so much noise. I mean, our our business is is rife with with conflict. Um, and, you know, uh, unfortunately, occasionally somewhat unscrupulous people. And I think that um, a lot of times what you end up seeing at, at, at sort of these, and, and I, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but sort of these lower tiers of the market, meaning lower asset size, mm -hmm. um, is you get, you know, really high fees, um, you get conflicted advice, uh, whereas, you know, someone has something to, to benefit from, from selling that thing to you, whatever that is. Sure. Um, and, uh, and and they're not really getting what I what I like to call unbiased advice. You know, it's just it's just someone who's just trying to help you out and, and talk to you the way that you and I are having a conversation right now and say, yeah. hey, you know, what makes sense for me? Um, and I think that you know the the average person out there tends to get um, advice from someone who's looking out for their own you know best interest, not necessarily for the client's best interest. So um, you, know, you generally want to find someone that has what we call a fiduciary capacity, meaning that they have to put the interests of the client ahead of their own. Um, I can't believe that that's not standard. No, I've, I've it's heard that not. Before. Yeah, it's yeah. it's not. And this is this has changed over the course of the last couple of years. So the Department of Labor issued um, a, a couple of years ago issued a highly controversial ruling within our industry where they were going to basically subject what historically have been stock and bond brokers. We call them financial advisors now, but they're still brokers um, to this suitability standard. Um, to uh, the fiduciary standard as opposed to what's historically been called the suitability standard. And the, the difference is, is really, really key. The difference with the suitability standards, is this a suitable investment for you? So even if I'm conflicted, even if it benefits me more than it benefits you per se, as long as it's considered a suitable investment, you can, you know, I, I could sell it to you. That sounds the, pretty gray too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, yeah, suitable. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and, and by the way, like there's a, yeah, there's a ton of gray areas in there. Um, the fiduciary standard of care um, is really about putting someone else's, you know, interest ahead of your own. And, and you know, I'll just quick plug for Northern Trust. You know, we've done that for a long time, and I think we do that effectively. Um, and, and I think so. It's it's just tough for people to find that kind of unbiased, easy advice. Again, you know, robo advice. I think I think there's drawbacks to it, but I think it's wonderful in the sense that it it gives people the ability to to get over that hump. You know, Scott, as you pointed out, to to get invested. You know, how do I get started? Sure. It's an easy way to get started without having to pay a whole bunch of commissions and fees and everything else. Now for people, you know, the biggest purchase most people will make in their life is is a home. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> if they are trying to save and scratch and claw every dollar they can, right, yep. to buy this house. Yep. Um, you know, that the sort of the American dream, right? Mm -hmm. Um where where I I I actually was speaking to some friends earlier today and I have some friends in their thirties who don't own homes mm -hmm. and you know, they live in California and they don't have necessarily high paying jobs and California has become a, a very hard place to live, especially Southern California yep. in, in, in specifically near the coast. Um, it's become a lot harder than other parts of the country mm -hmm. to live and to, to ultimately purchase a home. Uh, do you have any advice about the real estate man? I'm not. I know you're not a you know real estate expert mm -hmm. per se, but I like to think I am. Yeah, well, that's I like okay. to think I'm an expert. What, in what, what do you think? <laughs> I'm wrong a lot, but I'm an expert. Yeah, in yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> I have a two year old son. He thinks I'm an expert in everything. Oh, that's everything. great. Like, yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm an expert. Yeah. What do you think the inflection point is for someone who's who's you know who's who's trying to who's trying to scratch and claw to to, to save money, mm -hmm. and they want to buy a home. And it's like rent or buy, rent or buy. Yeah, and with the market yeah. being high yeah. and people being like, I can't afford, you know, I, I, I you know, pay a million dollars to get a piece of dog shit. Mm -hmm. um, or I pay, you know, $2 million and get another piece of dog shit over here. Um, I have one of those, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, it's a tough scenario to be in. What yeah. do you think about that? Oh, man, this is like the one question I was hoping you wouldn't ask me in the right <laughs> uh, question. Yeah. No, look, it's it's really difficult. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll speak from personal experience that, you know, the only thing that got me to buy my first house a few years ago was our rent got raised like so ridiculously high in this condo that my wife and I and, uh, were living in at the time. And I was like, all right, like now it's like they're just forcing me to, to do this. Um, but, but you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's really, really difficult. I think that, you know, there are some benefits obviously to home ownership. Um, you know, you can write off the mortgage expense. You can write off now in California, unfortunately, just a portion of the, um, uh, uh, property taxes that you pay. Um, I, I think 
you know, for, for most people, it's such a personalized decision that there's really no way to sort of say, you know, uh, this is kind of a blanket time when you should or shouldn't do it. You know, what I would advise folks to do is, you know, look at, you know, what are equivalent mortgage payments versus what you're paying in rent. Um, and then obviously that also implies that you're going to have some money to put down. Um, you know, there are various ways I think to, to try to shortcut that a little bit. I'm, a, I'm frankly, I'm a little nervous at some things that I'm starting to see now kind of creep back in that we saw in 2007 and 2008 you like? know, before the big housing crash, like, you know, no money down loans, um, mm. you know, less documentation for loans. I think for, for a traditional mortgage loan, I mean, at, at this point in time, you still have to like basically give a blood sample to get it. I mean, it's, I, I have a, a yeah. good paying job, steady paycheck, whatever. And they were like coming to me for oh, yeah. more information that I can even yeah. show me your papers <laughs> right, yeah, show exactly. me the papers <laughs> <laughs> which for my people has a has a bad connotation but um <laughs> but <laughs> um but uh but yeah I mean it's it's crazy but but there are you know sort of these you know what I like to call like shadow lenders out there where yeah. they're, they're willing to do things that are a little crazier um and and we're I think in very very small parts of the market we're starting to see these things creep in that we saw um greed right yeah, what's that? L loosening up the reins. Yeah, and just well, greed, and, and right? like and like in two thousand eight or two thousand leading up to two thousand eight, we had these things that they called um, Nina loans, which are no income, no assets. So you didn't have to prove that you had income, didn't sure. have to prove you had assets. Just anyone write down whatever you want. Yeah, and uh, and there, and there's other things now which, which I think have you know pluses and minuses. There's a company out there, and I, I can't remember the name of it, but. Um, when we were selling our house, I started getting solicitations from them because I think they figured out that if we were selling our house, it probably meant that we were going to buy a new one, which was true. And they'll basically pay a portion of your down payment, but then they have an ownership stake in your house and you basically have to pay them back when you sell the house. Um, and it's it looks great. Oh, jeez. And yeah. even I was like, oh, Balloon. wow, this is pretty cool. Like, I get uh -huh. to put, like, I only have to put 10% down now. And then you start to read the fine print. And you're like, well, maybe, like, maybe it's not. What's the thought. sketchy thing they. It's, it's like, I, I don't even, you know, it's going back a, a year now since we bought this house but it was it was something like I can't even remember there's a few of them out there but it was something like I think like they'll give you half your down payment so if you you know traditional home buyer you're putting 20% down right that's kind of the, sure. the standard um, so they'll give you half of that so they'll give you 10% of the purchase price of the house um, but then I think they get 50% of the appreciation value in the house when you go to sell it and if you don't sell it within like 20 years you have to pay them back at the end of the 20 year term, like some crazy amount of money based on like that, the, the then value of the house. So, so I, I, because I'm like a total finance and numbers geek, I actually ran the numbers, figure out like, could this make sense? And basically the only way it makes sense is if your house goes down in value. Oh, wow. Which over a twenty-year period of time is pretty unlikely to happen. Sure. Um, and so there, there. I think in in a sense, many of these companies are kind of banking on the idea that 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 you know that that people would buy into the fact that that could happen. Home prices over long periods of time tend to sort of trend with inflation. Um, so historically, we've seen roughly three percent inflation. That's what you can expect nationally from home prices. But here in Southern California, Scott, as you point out, our home prices tend to appreciate a little bit faster than that. Um, like a seven or eight percent clip, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you you tend to get higher rates growth, especially in these more desirable areas, like you were pointing out around the coast, right? Like sure. they're not making more beach in Malibu. So so even in difficult economic times like two thousand eight, two thousand nine, you know, we 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 still saw home prices not. They, they went down, but not as much as like sure. in you know the desert areas or places are maybe a little less desirable to live. So, sorry. So as speaking to his friends and when you rent and buy and, and mm -hmm. 60, 40 splits and, and safe and risky and all these yeah. kinds of things, real estate falls into the safe bucket? No, I, I wouldn't say that at all. I would say that real estate is still a risk asset. So, Liability. So yeah, see people think of it as being safe because it's not marked to market every day. So in other well, words, you're not parents, getting- it was safe. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but but th but think about this for a second. So there's a smoothing effect that takes place in your return stream on what do you mean real smoothing? estate, meaning that it's not priced every day, so you don't see the up and down. Sure. Right. You just you see the price when you get in, and you see the price when you get out. Right. Yep. That's all you see. Um, you don't see all the fluctuation along the way. And so this gets back to my earlier point where I was saying, look, are you pricing your house every day the way that you're pricing your portfolio or many people price their portfolio every day? Probably not. Um, and so we see this in certain asset classes, real estate being one of them where people view it as being safer than what it probably actually is. You know, I would tell you if you're planning to buy a home and you're going to stay there for five or two, I think average home ownership is somewhere around five years in a house, something like that. Most people think it's longer. Nationally, it's about five years. Um, if you're going to stay in a house for five or 10 years, 
probably a pretty good chance you'll do okay, even if you buy at the wrong time. Um, but I would say the same thing about an equity portfolio over a five or 10 year time horizon, you still have a positive expected return. So uh, st- sorry, when I say equity and stock, those are the same thing. Those are interchangeable. Um, you, you probably have, you know, as good a chance of making money in that as you do in real estate, but you got to live through the ups and downs, the daily ups and downs, you know, turning on the TV and seeing, Oh, the market's down 500 points today or 800 points. That's like one of the other interesting things about sensationalization of markets yeah. is this idea that like people are like, well, the market was down 500 points. Well, that's based on the Dow being at like 24,000 or wherever it is today. When the Dow was at 2,000, 500 points was a 25% drop. Right. When the Dow is at 24,000, it's like a 2% drop. So, so it, it's, it's again, it, the, the yeah. numbers sound big. <laughs> they sound so crazy. Oh my gosh, the market's down 500 points. For those of us that you know live and breathe this stuff every day, it's like, all right. Uh, what about, I mean, speaking of just because we're on the topic of, uh, topic of market being high mm-hmm. or Relative, what, sure. like high, yeah, yeah. what I mean, it might be higher 10 than years, it was. It might be 50 ago, though, sure. right? Yeah, it yeah, might yeah. be, right, who yeah, knows, yeah, right? Exactly, yeah. In 2008, it was, I think it was at 13,000 when mm-hmm. it, when it, when it, Correct. you know, we yep. had a big recession, quote unquote. You got a good memory. <clears throat> um, I don't know why I know these <laughs> things. Um, now it's 24,000, mm-hmm. right? So then that's in like 10 years, yep. right? Uh, what, you know, what do you make of that? Sure. So let, let's let's kind of rewind the table a bit and look at what happened, right? So we go back. We had all these excess, all these excesses in the housing market. Um, there's a, a lot of bad debt out Scumbags, there. Scumbags, I think, is the word. Sure. Yeah. I, I, you said that, not me. Those are many <laughs> many of my closest friends. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, but no, we we had some excesses in the in the market. There there was this kind of you know credit or or, or debt fueled speculation that took place. Everything got overheated banks got way over levered and the whole world fell apart. I mean, I don't think the average person understands like how close we were. Really bad. Yeah. I mean, it was like we were at, at points during that time. Um, and, and I was still fairly young in the business. I mean, I like to think of myself as still being young in the business. But then I was you know, still pretty green in the business. I'd only been in a few years. Um, and, and I don't think I understood the gravity of it. Now that some of these memoirs have come out, Ben Bernanke wrote a book who was the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Tim Geithner, who was Treasury Secretary under Obama at the time. Um, and, and they're literally talking about like, like we were within hours, uh, days or even hours of the financial system just completely collapsing under its own weight. I mean, this th- this is this when you when you say that, do you, you mean like you go to the bank to get your money and they're like, we can't give you. your Yeah, money. exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's like it's a wonderful <laughs> life. Like we were there. Well, I mean, banks were failing. Day, doesn't I mean, it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, don't you know, don't I mean, these were big banks, you know, IndyMac Bank, Washington Mutual. I mean, these were really, really yeah. large, powerful institutions that that just went by the wayside. Um, and, we, you know, so, so we think back, you know, if, if you look back over the last hundred years, I'm, I'm sorry to, to kind of get on the, no, on the this is pedestal great. here and, and talk about, talk about history, but you look back over the course of the last hundred years, we had the great depression, right? Which is the greatest financial calamity of anyone's lifetime. And, and this is, this is second to that and, and a really close second. You know, I would tell you that I think it could have been much worse had the government not taken the actions that they took at the time. Um, and I know that it was controversial. It's still controversial now. Um, what I would tell you, man, I've studied this stuff. I've spent a lot of time doing this. Um, I think that the actions that, um, uh, that the government took at that time are the only thing that could have saved us. Like there was not, no one else was coming to the rescue. So when you say that though, like the the idea that it is too big to fail, mm-hmm. is that a that's a is that a good thing? No, I I don't think it's a good thing. And and this is part of the issue, Scott, of what's happened over the course of the last ten years is that we've seen the big banks get even larger, and that's a really really scary thing. So they got way too big at the time. Everything fell apart. The government at the time decided that there should be, you know, what effectively became some public private partnership where they would guarantee some level of losses for the banks and the banks would take over these institutions and assume some of these loans and whatever and try to work it out. Because interest rates because interest rates got so low, because companies refinanced, their their balance sheets were in better shape. They became the companies became much healthier. The economy started to hum a little bit again. People started buying homes again, started buying cars again. You know, now we're back up to, to where we are today, and I think many folks would argue that there are now, you know, as I mentioned earlier, they're starting to show some signs of maybe a little bit of excess, not what we saw, I think, 10 or 11 years ago, um, but, but there is some out there. Um, but we were really, really close to calamity. And so the market, to your earlier point, Scott, you know, we had some overreaction, or in what in hindsight was overreaction. Markets went down, I think, I think 
uh, high to low, what we call peak to trough in the business, like 52%, some, somewhere along there, somewhere more, somewhere less. Um, and then a really, really sharp rebound in the market as a result of the fact that interest rates were, were dropped. So it became a lot cheaper to buy a home, a lot cheaper to start a business, a lot cheaper to buy a car, or whatever. And all of those things are stimulative to the economy. Now, the issue and what's happened over the course of the last few years is that much of that benefit didn't necessarily go to individuals. And that's why we see this great wealth disparity in this country. And again, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to be political here, but that, no, that's just yeah. a fact of the matter. Part, part of it, sure. Yeah. You know, a lot of that money flowed through into to corporate the top level coffers, execs, right? Exactly. Huge and, and, parachutes. and less so, less so to, um, to workers. So if you look at wage growth is a, is a good indicator of, you know, are, are sort of the, the folks in the middle or bottom parts of the economy benefiting wage growth has been pretty stagnant for a long period of time now, or, or quite low for a long period of time now. Um, and, and there's a whole host of reasons, you know, how the otherwise you can fuck get could the government bail? Out? I mean, it just seems so elementary, right? If the government's like, okay, you guys have fucked this up, right? You get agreed, got involved we're going to come in and fix this problem so the whole world doesn't fall apart. Mm -hmm. How the fuck were they like, we're going to fix this and give you guys this money, but we're going to tell you, you can't do X with it. You can't just give your guys this you know, massive salaries. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think they, they attempted to do that in, in, in certain they um, did in certain ways, but it wasn't necessarily it was a suggestion. I think as effective. It was a suggestion. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, very strong suggestion. Um, it wasn't necessarily as effective, I think, as as a lot of folks hoped it would be. Um, and you know, I, I, that's obviously in the past, and and we are where we are today. But you know, one of the the big gripes, I think. Um, that a lot of people have is they, they look at the situation and they say, well, many of the same people that were there 10 years ago are still running these institutions and they got this sure. massive government bailout and they got to cash a bunch of checks along the way and um, and, and, and here we are. I, th I believe it was in Sweden. I might be wrong on this, but I believe in Sweden they had a similar sort of bailout package that they put together for a lot of their large institutions and, and part of the deal was basically if, if you were um, you know an executive at that institution and you accepted, you you were shown the door basically and someone new had to come in. Um, and obviously we didn't, we didn't necessarily do that here. So, um, you know, but, but all that's a very long winded way of saying that things were really, really bad. Um, they've gotten a lot better over the course of the last 10 years. I think that, um, a lot of changes took place, uh, both in in sort of market structure and also in the economy that have that have benefited markets um, and uh, and investors, you know, the ones that held on and were able to withstand it have done pretty well. And this, I think, brings me back to my earlier point around you know allocating assets for a purpose. So, in other words, if you were sitting in a portfolio and you were saving money to buy a house that you were going to buy a year. Like, like, let's say that it was 2008 and you were planning to buy a house in 2009 and you had your all of your money in the market and your portfolio went down by 50%. You, you didn't have the money house, you needed yeah. when, when you needed to buy the house. But if you were smart about it and you had a plan in advance and you said, well, wait a minute, I'm going to need this money in a year, so I probably shouldn't be taking much risk with this, even if there is some gigantic upside that I maybe could have. Then, then you know, not only did you have the money to do it, but you're also able to buy the house a heck of a lot cheaper in 2009 than you were in 2007 or 2008. Um, and and so that's this idea around you know long-term investing. You know, I I put money into a 401k through work. Um, I'm not going to touch that money until I'm, you know, probably in my 60s or 70s. And so when 2008, 2009 hit, you know, I was trying to figure out how can I get more into this thing because I want to buy more now that you know markets have. Um, have taken a you know a big downdraft, um, and I and I you know uh, obviously was able to benefit from that. Um, so that that's this whole idea around you know time horizon, risk preference, whatever the case may be. So this, sorry, Scott, this might not be the right question for you, but what can people do to protect themselves? I mean, if, if you know if a lot of people lost their pensions and yeah, those things, and, sure, you know. So, you know, in, in looking at, at particularly at workplace plans, you know, what I always tell folks is, you know, there, there are benefits to owning your company stock in a, in a company retirement plan. Um, I would argue that that what we call tail risk, that that very low probability but totally catastrophic event probably outweighs the benefit. And that's just my opinion. So if you look um, at Enron. Uh, Enron is oh, yeah, you know, one of the greatest accounting scandals of, of our lifetime. It was the biggest bankruptcy at its time, but but was upstaged by, by a few others. For people who don't know, just give give a quick 
background on en- Enron, just sure. because some people are like, what the hell is Enron? Yeah, so Enron was an energy company um, that uh, was based, I believe they were based in Texas, um, and they were sort of a, what, what we call like a darling of Wall Street. They were a highly, highly profitable company. Um, long and short of it is, there was some corporate fraud that took place. Um, they were essentially hiding assets off their balance sheet that, that no one knew about, um, and they were using accounting tricks to make their earnings look better than they actually were. Eventually, this was caught on to. Um, the company went to bankruptcy. The executives went to jail. Um, but you know, importantly, many of these pensioners, as, as you point out, um, you know, lost much of their savings as a result of that because the company did go into bankruptcy. So, um, for example, if you own, if you work for Enron uh, and you have a four hundred one k. Um, so it's a, a workplace retirement plan. It's a, a savings vehicle that you can use that, that you own. You contribute to it and you own it. Um, a lot of those folks bought the company stock within that plan. So they were not only betting that you know the assets would go up over time, but they were also betting that the company would continue to be very profitable and do well. Well, the problem is when it went out of business, not only did they lose their jobs as a result of the bankruptcy, but then they also lost much of their assets as a result of it. So they had what we call concentration risk. That's this idea that uh, this this is the other side of the coin to diversification. This is this idea that you're you're really betting on one thing. Um, I I don't like to do that. I don't recommend that people do that. If it works, it works really well, right? Bill Gates got pretty rich owning primarily Microsoft stock, right? Warren Buffett did pretty well owning Berkshire Hathaway, although that's that's diversified. Um, but you know, there are a, a countless number of examples um, of folks out there that did really well just concentrating their assets in one thing. I would argue that, um, to quote my hero Bruce Springsteen, the highways jammed with broken heroes. Right? I mean, there's for every one of those folks, there's a thousand out there that you know bet the farm on one thing and and lost big. Sure. And Bill Gates, I mean, you know, he was a one in a million, like, uh, you know, guy who was changing. He was, you know, Steve Jobs right. of his time. He was right. He changed the whole landscape of the computer. Yeah. Industry and most and of us, internet. I mean, you know, I hate to admit this, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not Bill Gates, nor, nor am I Steve Jobs. Um, yeah. and, and most of us aren't. So yeah, you know, I would, um, I would say that for, for most folks, you know, one of the things that they can do again, is just, you know, make sure you're diversified, make sure you understand the ins and outs of any of these retirement plans. Um, everyone's a little bit different. Every company has a different plan. Some companies don't have a plan, so you kind of have to do it on your own. Um, so I think, you know, understanding the trade-offs, you know, benefits to any of these things is, is incredibly But important. they lost their, when you say they lost their pensions, uh, so they were, do they lose the money that wasn't allocated towards the, you know they were saying okay I want to buy I want to buy deeper right. into Enron right yep. but did they lose the money that wasn't invested they, they had it no. in the market no no no, no, no. The I mean whatever that 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 money was okay but the, there's two different things here so a pension is a corporate liability. So if the company goes out of business, you lose you lose that money. So you had a lot of these folks. There's no money set set aside for those. No, I mean well, there, I mean there is, but it's a it's a it's a general liability of the of the corporation, so it gets wiped out. You know, Got it. often I shouldn't say always, but oftentimes it can get wiped out. There's no insurance that backs that. Right. Yeah. And so people are looking at it and they're saying, okay, well, I'm 60 years old. I'm going to retire in five years. I'm going to get a check from this company for fifty thousand dollars a year for the rest of my life, or whatever the number is. Sure. Well, all of a sudden, the company goes away and that's gone. You know. So you got to make sure that as you plan yourself out through time, you have these kind of fail safes set in to where if you're depending on that check coming in every month, I sure wouldn't have all of the money that I control also invested in the stock. Yeah. Right? I mean, you're just betting way too big on one thing. And it seems crazy in hindsight, and it is crazy. But at the time, everyone's making money. Everyone's fat and happy. Yeah. You know, why would I change anything? Well, right? it was a big energy company. It's like, it would be like if you, you know, worked for, you know, General Electric, right? Mm-hmm. And you're like, well, that's never going out of business. Mm-hmm. General you know? Electric, I mean, look, GE, <laughs> or Ford, know, or GM, their, or their yeah. stock price went from 40 to 6 during the financial crisis. I mean, they were teetering as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things that, that, you know, I think is always, you know, safe to say when you're, when you're talking about finances to expect the unexpected. You know, we have these, what we call tail risk events, black swan events, whatever you want to refer to them as. And, you know, risk is this idea that more things can happen than actually will happen. Right. So when you think about, well, what are the risks? Well, show me an investment. I could show you 50 different risks with that investment. None of them may come true. One of them, two of them, probably not all 50 of them are going to come to pass unless it's like Enron, sure. in which case it was like everything that could happen did happen. Um, but, but you know, that, that's really fundamental to understand, you know, what is risk? And this is really what risk is. It's this idea that there are a lot of things that can happen, but not all of them will happen. That's a good way to put it. Um, 
what do you think the next thing? I mean, you see any sketchy things in the market where you go, mm, I don't like that? No, I mean, I, I tend to be horribly bad at, at predicting these things. And, and I'm not asking um, you to pre- predict the market because nobody yeah. has a crystal ball. Yeah. What I'm, what, you know, people, there were people who, who were like, wow, the, the, this is, yeah. uh, you know. 2007, you're saying? Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. There, there were people who knew this was bad paper out there. Yep. I've heard, and I don't know if it's true, uh, there are similar things going on with auto loans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, with a lot of bad paper, a lot of people who, you know, these buy, they buy and sell these cars. Yeah. And they- I, you know, what I would tell you is I think, you know, if you look at, you know, debt, debt is always a scary thing. Debt is really, what I like to say is debt is a magnifying glass. So it magnifies things on the way up, it magnifies things on the way down. Mm-hmm. And um, we've had incredibly low interest rates for a very long period of time now, you know, and, um, w- we, we've never had a monetary policy experiment. When I say monetary policy, so the, the Federal Reserve Bank sets interest rates, right? Um, and and that's you know that's how banks figure out well what are we going to charge people is really based off sort of the broader interest rate environment. Um, and when I look at it and I say, well, we've gone through this unprecedented experience of basically going to zero percent interest rates. You know, you could you could get a mortgage for a long time. There were some mortgages being issued you know below three percent. Well, over time, that that's going to change. We're starting to see that change. We're starting to see rates come up a little bit, um, and we just don't know what the sort of unintended consequences or effects of all this is going to be, you know, over a long period of time because we've never done it before, right? Um, and so, I think if I if if someone was to say to me, well, what creates the greatest you know anxiety and uncertainty right now? I would say it's that is that we're unwinding this gigantic experiment that took place in two thousand eight, and again, the government had to take unprecedented steps. I hate that I keep using that word, but um, it really was unprecedented. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, taking steps that they've never taken before to stabilize the system, and one of those that probably the the most pronounced step was cutting interest rates as low as they could possibly get them. So get them all the way down to zero. We to see get governments buy other, again. Yeah, well, we've seen co- governments in other countries go negative, so negative interest rates. So they're gonna they're gonna pay you to borrow money. Wow, <laughs> right? That's insane. And we just don't know what the effect of all this is going to be. You know, I wish I was smart enough to figure it out. If but I like, was. we actually don't know. Mm-mm. It's never happened before. I mean, it's happened for very, very short periods of time. But um, uh, there was one of the Scandinavian countries. I can't remember which one where they were talking about that they had negative interest rates on mortgages, so they were actually paying people to take mortgages. The problem was that that the house prices were falling so fast and there was so much deflation in the economy that people were still just like, even if you pay me to do it, I'm not going to do it. I'll just pay my rent and not have to worry about the asset going down in, in value. So there's no there's no free lunch here. Who regulates the Federal Reserve? <laughs> 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 so that's, again, I, you know, that's a very politically charged question. Um, there's a whole... I'm trying, Peter. I'm trying. Yeah, I hear you. There's a whole host of folks out there that, that have this whole idea of auditing the Fed. Um, I mean, they, they, you know, are, are, a, um, a branch of the government that, that really is sort of under their own, they kind of dance to be their own drum, so to speak. Um, and, uh, it's, it's a little more complicated than that, but I think we'll probably just leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if nobody knows like what the effects of like any of this stuff are, is it people are just like drunken sailors? Like, ah, well, like, well, that's, that's what yeah, well, and that's what people I'm are worried like, about, right? Like they're like, some more. well, yeah. wait a minute. Like, you know, maybe Maybe folks are buying houses that they never should have been buying in the first place just because the mortgage payment is so low because the interest rate is so sure. low and they buy an adjustable rate loan. And now all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, I was paying this teaser rate of 3%. My loan adjusts five years from now and maybe at that point it's going to be 6 or 7%. And now all of a sudden I can't afford the mortgage payment anymore. Sure. That, that's, a, that's a problem, right? Yeah. And um, again, you know, we saw it uh, previously. Uh, 10 years ago, you know, we're seeing home equity lines make a big comeback now. A lot of people have taken on, you know, these very large home equity lines um, because the equity in their house has, has gone up so much, you know, they're going to take out some debt against it. Um, and, you know, we don't know, you know, th- I, I can guarantee you that there will be some calamity that will take place. You know, I have no idea what it was. I wouldn't have told you it was going to be subprime mortgage loans in 2008. Maybe I'll come back to this podcast 10 years from now and go, oh, I, I called the low interest rate thing. That's going to be a huge problem. Um, or maybe 10 years from now, I'll be like, wow, I can't believe rates are still so low. And I was such an idiot. You know, I, I don't know. But it's, you know, it's a humbling thing. Now, when <laughs> when the when the government prints, what was it, $8 trillion or $3 mm-hmm. trillion, what, how, how many trillion? 
Well, we're we're twenty twenty trillion in the hole right now. Twenty yeah. trillion in the hole, but I mean, when when they did the bailout, yeah, the bailout was was it eight? Well, there was there was a Three? bunch of them because you had cash for clunkers, you had tarp, you had I don't I don't remember what the exact number was. You did have to I would have had to have done some homework before coming in here, which I generally hate doing, which That's is why okay. I was such a terrible student. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you how I got through college. <laughs> I told you. You often. did, yeah. We'll, we'll keep that <laughs> offline. <laughs> um, so. If, when they print that money, mm-hmm. explain to me just just from a financial like outlook. If you print money mm-hmm. that doesn't really exist, mm-hmm. there's inflation, mm-hmm. right? Potentially, yeah. So how does that work? How how can you just print money? Doesn't how does that? Well, what are the the effects of the, the that happens to the dollar then? Sure. So um, this this is a. a Really, really complicated question with a super complicated answer. So I'm just going to stay like very, very surface level here for okay. a minute. Yeah, but it's fine. Essentially, um, what happens is w- when you print more of this money, you know, first of all, we did print a lot of money. It didn't necessarily get recycled into the economy, which is why we've still seen low levels of inflation. So this is something that a lot of people, if you go back and, and look at the literature 10 years ago, um, the the thing I always laugh at there was a, there was a ton of commercials that ran primarily on Fox News that was kind of their big outlet where it was like buy silver and gold because inflation is going to go crazy with all this you know money printing that didn't come to pass. Now they weren't wrong that you know when you print a lot of money it tends to lead to higher levels of inflation, but the money has to make its way back into the economy. What ultimately ended up happening again it's a really complicated answer, but basically. Um, it was easier for for it to just sit on like a bank's balance sheet than it was to recycle it back in. So in other words, many of these large banks didn't make loans equivalent to the amount of money that kind of came in mm. um, in order to to recycle it back in. So had it recycled it back in, you know, my opinion is you probably would have seen higher levels of growth and higher levels of inflation in the economy. Um, we didn't see that. In fact, one of the the interesting things I think over the course of the last ten years and and why we've said the market has sort of climbed this wall of worry is everyone said, well, economic growth is still really quite low, right? We haven't seen this runaway economy like we saw in the 1980s where you could get, you know, a four or five percent GDP growth. You know, we've seen, you know, between probably one and two and a half percent economic growth, but the market is so far outpaced that, you know, if you just looked at the market, you would say, and, and the growth we've seen in the market over the course of the last 10 years, you'd say, well, geez, I bet you the economic environment's probably pretty good, right? Well, we haven't necessarily seen that. Um, and again, that goes back to this idea around interest rate policy. Um, but to get back to your question about the dollar, yeah, that, that longer term, it's, it's probably a negative for the dollar. Um, you know, The dollar is probably going to have a tough time um, if, in fact, inflation comes to pass, if, in fact, we have to fight that with um, with with higher rates. And I think that the, the bigger thing is probably, you know, what happens with many of these, you know, um, large trading partners that are coming online, you know, be it China or, or whomever else, um, you know, do they kind of become the next superpower? Um, and and does their currency maybe even replace the dollar as as sort of the world's reserve? I don't think that's going to happen, but it, you know, it's, it's certainly possible. So you're saying that we might not we might not have seen the inflation come back around yet. Yeah, exactly. And so what we're seeing now is is you know, inflation expectations have picked up, um, but not. Um, to a level that I think is concerning to most folks in my business. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if you look at wage growth, um, again, you know, still quite low. Um, Energy costs have, have, you know, obviously popped up a little bit, particularly of late, um, with some of the volatility we've seen in the Middle East. Um, But Speaking of energy, Mm -hmm. that's what I hear is, protects the dollar somewhat, right? Mm -hmm. Because we all all oil is bought in US dollars correct, yep. correct? and this yeah <clears throat> this is what I was referring well, to that's earlier why we don't like if, the middle east right if, if, well if, if, if you replace the if you replace the, the yeah if you replace the dollar as a reserve currency you know what happens um, there was a lot of talk 10 or 12 years ago where people started saying well the euro was so strong at the time you had uh, i don't know if you guys remember this you had a lot of people that would come on these like shopping trips to the US because the the euro was so strong you could just buy stuff so cheap here um, obviously that changed a lot with the debt crisis in in Europe over the course of the last few years but um, but yeah there was talk at the time of hey maybe maybe we'll just denominate everything in euro. Maybe, you know, we'll start buying oil in euros rather than dollars. Um, didn't come to pass. I remember that the, for some reason, it's like, well, I have a pretty good memory. And something that sticks in my mind is I remember that uh, Giselle Bunchen was owed some gigantic modeling contract and she requested to be paid in euros, not dollars. I remember people pointing to that as like, oh, maybe, you know, 
Um, you know, maybe this is how people are going to start exchanging goods and services. It's all going to be euro-based, not going to be dollar-based. Now, obviously, that didn't come to pass. Um, the, and the dollar over the course of the last few years, she's been pretty strong. You know, it's 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 done pretty well. Um, uh, but you know, as we as we move forward, we'll have to see what happens. So, do, but does it? How does that work with if if oil is bought in U.S. dollars? Right. Mm-hmm. That's like we mandate that. Right. Mm-hmm. Worldwide. Mm-hmm. Does that that somewhat protects? Yeah, I mean, there's just a greater demand for it, right? So if you're going to be buying something in a certain currency, um, like oil, I mean, something that's that's you know as as widely used, um, there, it's going to create a natural amount of demand for that currency, right? Well, if all of a sudden you change that and you create a demand for other currency, people start selling dollars to buy euro or sure. or um, Chinese yuan or I mean, you know Japanese yen, whatever the case may be. Um, that's how you could get you know potentially you know sort of uh, you know dollar weakness. Um, and again, going back to this fundamental idea of supply and demand, um, you know as as the demand falls for it, you know, naturally price moves lower. Interesting. Why do you think the market is like has these growth and then bubbles? Yep. And then, you know, pop grows, 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 pop. Why doesn't it just is it is it because of is it because of emotions? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a great question. I mean, I I, I think you know, in, in part, sure, you, know, you could say emotions day to day. You know, things change. I I still think oftentimes of this idea of the smoothing effect, right? So it's this idea that because it's priced on a day to day basis, you're naturally going to see more emotion coming to you. You're naturally going to see more volatility. Um, I still maintain if you price real estate on a day to day basis, you'd see just as much volatility. I I, I, I fundamentally believe that. I have no proof for that. Sure. Um, as with most things, I believe I just believe it. Um, <laughs> but um, but I but I really do think that that's true. And so um, you know, it's it it's an asset that's priced on a daily basis. So naturally, you're going to see more volatility. Yeah, there's emotion that comes into it. Yeah, there's you know naturally scares. I mean, you have people that um, you know maybe follow it a little more closely, and and you know they they get in or out based on maybe some you know global event. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's just it's a mark to market asset. It's an asset that's priced daily, and and you're going to see that if you look at returns from other asset classes and you extract out um, debt or you know you extract out leverage, whatever the case may be, you know oftentimes you, know, you see a pretty similar return series over long periods of time. It's just they don't have to price them every day. So private equity is private investing is another area where if you strip out the amount of debt that tends to to accumulate in that you kind of get back to a, a normal return. Look at house prices. Most people think, you know, as, as, as you pointed out earlier, to me, you know, how house, you know, most people consider a house to be a pretty safe investment, right? I mean, that's kind of what we're all working towards over a long sure. period of time, right? Yeah. It's the American dream. Um, you know, you, caveman you should, times, a shelter, right? Yeah, ex- just, I mean, it's, it's great. <laughs> just want a cool place um, you can to use call it as an ATM home. too. Just you know, <laughs> yeah. stick a home equity line of credit on that bad boy, and you're good to go. But uh, but you know, you strip out the leverage, so you strip out the fact that a, a bank is willing to give you four to one on your money to buy the thing. Yeah, returns are sort of are what they are. They're somewhat pedestrian. I mean, some of the bubbles certainly, you know, 2008, there was a lot of bad paper. And what Scott means by that is, you know, giving people loans that can't afford them. Yep. Um, so that certainly contributed. And, and, you know, again, not to get political about is regulation the answer? Is not regulation the answer? I don't fucking know. That's not the point. But um, I lost my train of thought. I don't, I don't know, know what my point was, what were you but saying? Uh, you know, we were t- just talking about crashes and, and things like that. So a lot bubbles. of times it, it does happen bubbles. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, uh, tech and all those kinds of things. And now cryptocurrency. Yeah. So, oh, so and I'm just seeing investment after inv- and yeah. you know, they're raising a hundred million dollars on nothing. Yeah. Oh man. This is like, this is the second one that I hope we were able to He's like, I don't want to talk about the rent versus <laughs> buy thing. I don't want to talk about cryptocurrencies. And here you we are. You didn't tell me, Peter. But I can't, yeah. No, look, <laughs> this is what I can tell you. And I'm going to give you the same stock answer that every person that works in finance will give you. The underlying technology upon which cryptocurrency is based, which is this idea of blockchain technology, um, certainly has legs to it and, and is in wide use by, you know, every major company out there. Um, crypto, you know, uh, be it Bitcoin or, or any of these others, and, and frankly, I don't follow them that closely. Um, but uh, but I think it's it, it, it's pretty speculative. You know, I I know people are saying, well, you should put you know some of your money into this a diversification. I I tell you, you get plenty of diversification from stocks, bonds, and real estate, and the rest of it's just kind of noise. That's sort of so not in, not into that, not into the crypto. Right? Not not yeah. my it's not my jam. But look, I mean, on any of this stuff, it's like if you're right. 
that's cool. Right. I don't know. Yeah. Like, you know, I, like, yeah. what do I know? I, you know, I'm just like another guy out here hawking stocks and bonds, you know, <laughs> right? I'm just like, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but, uh, well, it just seems too early to tell. Like I, I, I do, I agree with you what you say, like the fundamental technology behind it, right? The blockchain system mm -hmm. seems like there's use for it mm -hmm. somewhere. No question. How it is applicated, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's, it's we decide it's this currency or if it's you know or if it's banks ultimately yeah use it um it just seems too uh like you said too speculative and too you know uh, you know the idea that someone just you know I, it is it is weird because on one hand it's the idea that someone just created this thing mm -hmm. and that it could be hacked it could be in your eye wallet or whatever it could be stolen mm -hmm. um is like this crazy idea but then at the same time it's also like if everyone believes in it that's that's money well and there's a, and there's that's a fixed <laughs> there's there's a fixed supply of it yeah right and so they they can't just print more of it as they as you know i think advocates for it are, are fond of pointing out that fiat currency so so you know kind of these government-based currencies u.s dollar or euro they can always print more if they need it Mm -hmm. Right, so you, they can devalue sure. your dollar by by creating more supply. With with Bitcoin, I know, for example, they say, well, there's a, there's a fixed amount that's released in sort of decreasing amounts, I guess, over time. Um, which uh, you they know, say, I, though, right? They like mm -hmm. who's they, and who's saying it? Like, yeah, it's like okay, cool, I get it. They're mining it. They're doing these things, right? Yeah, but I. Yeah, I, I look. I don't know who the who the experts are. Um, you know, again, I I pay I think somewhat limited attention to it. The only reason it's kind of come across my desk is I do you know occasionally have clients that'll ask about it. Typically, it's their kids that ask about it, younger <laughs> folks. You know that that I think ask yeah, about it. Sure. Um, and I'm just like like anything. I'm just like look. I can show you all the risk. So what's the risk, right? You, you don't have liquidity. You could get hacked. I mean, you know, like anything, there's a million risks. There's risks in, in having cash under your mattress, right? Your house sure. can burn down. Yeah. Um, when so you say you don't do, have liquidity, what exactly do you mean? Because that's I hear it's hard to 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 buy and sell it. Yeah. Right? You know? So liquidity risk, you know, liquidity is the idea of how quickly can you liquefy something? How quickly can you turn it into cash? How quickly can you have it in your hand? And so liquidity risk, we, and we often see this, you know, real estate is a perfect example. You know, if you buy a house, you have liquidity risk because you can't easily just turn that into cash. You got to uh, get it staged. You got to hire a real estate agent. You got to get it sold. It, it might be, you know, months um, before Years. you, yeah, who knows, right? Depends. Before you, before you actually California get it sold. Hours. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you'll get like 24 offers in the first hour and I think it closes in hour six. Um, but so liquidity risk is the idea of how quickly can, you know, or, or the idea that you couldn't quickly turn something into cash. And, and to your point, um, crypto is, you know, uh, up until now at least has been largely unregulated. You've had these exchanges where you can go. And um, I know I've read just on Twitter, so I must be well informed. Oh, um, it's on Twitter. <laughs> it's definitely true. It's on the intro <laughs> web, so it must be true. Um, you know, I've, I've read that there are, you know, days or even, you know, weeks where, you know, you can't, you know, you sell it and you got to wait to get the money back and, and whatever. So, um, you know, uh, th that's essentially lo what liquidity risk is. Sure. If you own a bond or you own a stock that's that's publicly traded, um, you know there, there's a good chance that you could have pretty good liquidity in that stuff. Um, oftentimes, you can you know even have same day liquidity. So, yeah, it seems it seems uh, it seems really bizarre. And also, which sort of concerns me, it's like the guy whoever invented Bitcoin, right, mm -hmm. or invented blockchain. Yeah, uh, he has like <laughs> three billion dollars right, yeah, worth yeah, of Bitcoin. Like, <laughs> and no one well, knows that who seems he is. Like, yeah, that's, yeah. You know, no one knows who he is. It's like, that seems like it benefits like one person really right, well right, and right, not yeah. the other people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm more kind of the old school, like, can I touch and feel it sort of thing? Sure. And, you know, can I understand what it is? Um, and I just try to stay away from stuff that, you know, again, I know what I don't know. Um, I know that I'm not an expert on cryptocurrencies. I've listened to a lot of the experts. I don't think they're experts on cryptocurrencies. Yeah. <laughs> I know shit, right? I hear these people talk about it. I'm like, I'm just you like, know oh, the man. Idea what the fuck you know, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I you know, so again, I think, and I think this is good, like just, just good general, like personal finance or investing advice. Like stick to what you know. 
you know, if you don't know, you know, hire someone who does, who's, you know, who's good at what they do. Um, and, and the same goes for that. And, uh, you know, we're still in the very early stages. I mean, to your point, like we don't know who the winner is going to be in all this stuff. Right. I mean, if you, if you, um, went back, uh, to like perfect example is Apple. Apple's the largest company in the world now. I mean, had you gone back to the early days, people say, geez, you know, you should have bought stock in things, Apple. Yeah. Dell but, and all yeah, those I mean, companies there was a ton of them up. out there, right? And there's yeah. a ton of them that, you know, again, highways jammed with broken heroes, right? You got, I knew I'd get two Springsteen references. In. <laughs> <laughs> I can leave now, by the way, because I'm like, I got two Springsteen no, references. Good. I'm good to go. Um, but yeah, but I mean, you know, it's very, very hard to pick a winner in advance because there's so many things that, that impact it. Um, there's a ton of luck involved in any of this stuff. I mean, Microsoft bailed out Apple. Don't, don't forget about that. Microsoft bailed out Apple. Apple would not exist if it wasn't for Microsoft, um, it, you know, in the early days. So, um, you know, difficult to pick a winner in advance. And I'd say crypto is like the, the does, ultimate example. Does, of does, like, does Bill Gates own a ton of Apple because They of that? did. I think they divested um, their, their stake in it. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, the Apple is like an, un, I mean, it's such an amazing story. I mean, any of these large companies, you know, have a great story behind them. And Apple is, is definitely, you know, jobs got bounced out of there and then, yeah. you know, they brought them back when John Skinner left, um, who's a former, I think, CEO of Pepsi. Um, and, uh, and, and I mean, they were within like days of bankruptcy and, and jobs really. This is what in. circa what year? Like mid eighties, I want to say okay. something like that. Um, and you know, but you had a guy at the helm who, who was really an innovator, you know, yeah. who was really a bright guy also a maniac, but yeah, yeah, but you know, <laughs> but hey, you know, brilliance, you know, along with brilliance, oftentimes, you know, comes, comes insanity, manic, yeah. as my wife will tell you, <laughs> um, you guys didn't think this was all like fun and games here. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, and so I think that, you know, you've got a, a really brilliant person and I don't know who that cryptocurrency person is going to be. I mean, there's going to be people that make a lot of money off this stuff. There already have been. I mean, you see these guys on TV. I was watching the other day. There was like a 17 year old kid that made like 127 million dollars trading cryptocurrencies Jesus. or something. No, I'm just like, I don't know. This feels a little speculative to me. <laughs> yeah. Did he really? Yeah, I don't even. I, I 127 million dollars. Like, I might be off by a by a decimal point. Wow. Maybe it was 12.7, or maybe it was 1.2. I, I don't know, but yeah, it was a, it was a big number, more money than I have. Let's put it that way. But how would you even get that money out? That's what I'm like. Well, yeah, and right, and so like that's the question is like, and again, I don't I don't even know how any of this stuff works. Yeah. So I mean, we're just like you know not really going to get to to the right answer well, here but it's fine but i don't understand maybe one of your listeners will call into you and be like here's like, the yeah, jam like we're gonna yeah, million. we're gonna do this <laughs> yeah exactly so that's, that's uh yeah that's just crazy the internet man isn't it un isn't it wild how many people have created wealth because of this system where you can like talk to people and you know communicate create something online people can buy it there's yeah. commerce it's like everyone's got their store f that doesn't have to have a store. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, look at Amazon, right? I mean, Amazon like owns the world now. Mm. Um, it's, uh, it, it really is like the modern day gold rush. That's like way better than a gold rush. Cause it's created way more gazillionaires in the world. It's <laughs> so crazy. So good. Speaking of smart, crazy people, uh, what I, I always like sort of point to, um, Oh, what's his name? He owns Tesla. I'm, I'm oh, thinking. Elon Musk. Elon Musk, yeah. right? He's like this smart, insanely yeah. brilliant guy, but also like just makes like wild claims. And like, <laughs> they're like, well, yeah. how are you guys going to actually do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but sure. like if you fake it and you make it, then, it, Why not, then it's right? real. Yeah, and somebody's exactly. got to say, hey, let's go to the moon. You yeah. Know? Somebody has to do yeah. it. Yeah. The, I, today is, I don't know if it's the, I want to say it's the, I think today is the 20th anniversary of Amazon going public. Mm. Um. And like so I was, I was reading this morning again on Twitter where I get all my news from. Sure. Um, so everything has to be 140 characters or less. <laughs> like I'm good. If it's more than 140 characters, I'm like, like anything long form, I like, I, I can't read. But, yeah. uh, but no, they were talking about. I think 20 years ago today, Amazon went public, and like they were, they were a online Book bookseller, yep. right? I mean, it was just like, and who would have thought that it would have spawned into all these different areas and. Um, you know, you've got these brilliant guys who, who take, and again, you know, going back to it, like you take a ton of risk, right? You could have bought Amazon at 18 bucks a share on, on the day it IPO'd 20 years ago. Um, but they were just an online bookseller who would have ever thought that they'd be trading sure. for 15, 1600 bucks a share, whatever it is today. And that, um, they'd have the just 
unbelievably astronomical growth that they've had. And that's sort of the beauty of this stuff is, you know, you never know. So again, going back, I'm going to bring it full circle back to diversification. If you diversify, you have a little bit of everything. You're going to catch those. Um, and you're going to catch some of the falling knives as well. Right. But yep. that's okay. That's, that's to be expected. Sure. But if you're right, you know, 60% of the time, you're going to do pretty well over time with this stuff. Hear that? Diversify people. Diversify. Absolutely. Well, shit, man. Thank you so much for coming in today. Yeah, thank you. No, this is great. I feel like, I mean, I could go like another couple of hours if you guys want. If you guys want <laughs> to do like, you guys would be like Red part Bowl two, part three. Or? Go buy some yeah. Bitcoin. It'd be fucking great. <laughs> More questions about part the two, Federal Reserve. Part two is just all cryptocurrency. Yeah, Burn the internet down. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Peter, so Sweet. much for thank coming Thank you guys in, very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, buddy.